Uh, hi. I'm Lucy Steigerwald for uh, Liberty.me, and um, this is Politics for People Who Hate Politics, and we're going to do a little chat about the popos, that is to say, the police. Um, and my guest today, pardon me as I fiddle with my audio and try to make things work, but they never ever do. Oh, Lord. Okay. You know what? Um, today we have our lovely guests. Um, we have uh, Michael Tracy, who is a reporter, and he has written for um, some quality publications like Vice, uh, Reason, The American Conservative, and The Nation, and some less quality publications like Salon. Uh -huh. um, we have Justin Glaw, who is a roving reporter person as well. I feel like Michael Tracy uses that term sometimes. Um, and Justin has written for um, uh, Vice, and he has done some Daily Beast stuff lately, particularly on the and about uh, the big old mess in Ferguson. And I'm going to ask him about that. And we had have at least the audio, I'm hoping, of Ed uh, Kryowski. Kryowski. I, I can do it. I can do it. Steigerwald's been butchered enough that I should be able to do that. And Ed is an associate editor for Reason 24-7 News, and he has done a lot of awesome stuff about the cops in the past um, two years or so. So welcome, gents. Thanks for coming. Thanks. I think I'm here. <laughs> I believe you are as well. I think you're all here. Um, I like the fact okay. that this is a disembodied voice. Yeah, we did that on the Paranoia podcast with with um, with Franklin Harris, and it, it kind of added to the atmosphere. It's not really as relevant here, um, sadly, but we'll work with it. Uh, there's an echo. This, this technical thing is driving me crazy today. I'm out of uh, Hangouts practice here. All right. Let's start with a little bit, um, Justin. I know you actually went down to Ferguson, um, and you wrote that up for the Daily Beast. Um, can you tell us what that was like for a minute or so? Just like, I don't know. Can yeah. you set the scene? Yeah, it was totally surreal. Um, I like the first night I got down there. They were, I mean, I got there at the moment when it like popped off, and cops were shooting tear gas canisters and rubber bullets and it was just like really surreal to be in that environment and to think like this is a suburb of a midwestern city in the 90s or something like that um, so it was just very strange to be there and to like witness all of that happening had you done any I mean you had, you had done a vice thing about um, <laughs> the, the swat Raid over a Twitter account of the yeah. Doria, but it had you, <laughs> which yeah. was an amazing um, and really disturbing, but yeah. also funny, but also mostly disturbing. <laughs> um, had you done like, had you had you had you seen kind of what police can look like in America today before you got to Ferguson? Like, had you had you seen anything like that before? Yeah, I mean, I've done I've done crime reporting uh, for two you know, like, small and mid-market newspapers uh, since, like, t uh, summer of 2011. So, I mean, I've been on, like, uh, standoff scenes, one particular one that lasted, like, six hours for this paper that I worked at up in northern Minnesota. So, like, I've seen cops in battle gear, like, in camouflage with sniper rifles and MRAPs and all of that stuff. So it wasn't anything that was, like, super bizarre. It was just the level to which they had taken it and the amount, I guess. Like, it's one thing when the the stand-up situation in northern Minnesota was one thing where the guy's got, like, a high-powered rifle and he's clearly, like, presenting a danger to the community around him and that's why they responded with the level of force that they did. But Ferguson was different in that the people were there were, like, armed with, like, water bottles. And that's and they were responding with M14s and MRAPs. So, right. And if if the body armor is not to protect you from water bottles being thrown at you, I'm not sure what it's for at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I guess in in, in general, um, we can ask uh, the re the rest of you to as well. Um, Ferguson kind of made. You guys, all three of you, might have done some stuff about cops 
being absurd before Ferguson, but it definitely seemed like Ferguson all of a sudden, uh, the mainstream media at large discovered, oh my God, cops. Cops are a thing. I mean, you would turn on MSNBC in particular, and they were covering this for hours, for um, for, for days, on like a week there, I guess. Um, can we talk about the, the fact that this... And I, it, obviously it's leveled off since then, and it's not as, you know, it's not suddenly, like, the, the big story. Uh, thanks, uh, Middle Eastern shenanigans. But it's still, like, do you think that it did some good in just getting more people to pay attention to, like, what, what the hell are the cops doing? Yeah, so I, I want to make a point about this, because I covered Occupy quite extensively, as you probably recall, mm -hmm. in New York in particular, but elsewhere. And... Um, so, you know, I feel like a lot of the groundwork, and I'm not, I'm not setting Arbit Occupy as an arbitrary starting point for this, but I feel like a lot of the precedent in the terms of the police response to Occupy kind of, um, contributed to what we saw manifest in Ferguson, in that, uh, first of all, there was, in, in, in New York, the police arrested journalists indiscriminately. And we suffered no consequences for it, despite like all the major newspapers and media outlets in the city uh, authoring a letter to the NYPD in like really stern terms denouncing their conduct. So like even the New York Post was in on that letter, and um, you know there was never any accountability for it whatsoever. And of course, I'm not drawing a direct link between the NYPD conduct and the conduct in a suburb of St. Louis, but like it kind of contributes to the general zeitgeist of police just acting with total impunity but uh, but I think you know the the good that came out of Ferguson came from like the, the people like the, generally the right-wing media despised Occupy despite my best attempts to convince them that there were like libertarians involved and constitutionalists involved and so forth uh, and and try and I goaded Ron Paul into uh, <laughs> uh, supporting Ron it. Paul became, was good on it he started to try to reach I know. out I was to the first one to interview him about it were you really? Yeah. I'll send you the link. Uh, I interviewed him for a reason about it. I, I legitimately do not remember that, which is really weird. I must have... I'll send, it to, I'll send it to you. Okay, um, yeah. I, I actually, I want to see that. But, uh, so, <laughs> um, uh, so, like, the, the right-wing media complex despised Occupy, if you can recall. They did, like, rape slur... Uh, they, like, made up rape allegations about... Dude, I, I stood a foot from Andrew Breitbart as he screamed at Occupy DC, stop raping people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But they couldn't really do that for the Ferguson protest because the grievance was so blindingly obvious because it was largely black, meaning that, you know, there was, a, there was more historic, like they couldn't dismiss it as like trust fund white hipsters. Right, right. Thing. Um. But they so, could dismiss so, it so as that, looters. That drew their, the, so that drew their attention to the overblown police response a little more forcefully, such that it couldn't be dismissed as this kind of, you know, willy-nilly idiot protest block that showed up. So I think that is why the media response kind of manifested in the way it did. And MSNBC covered it a lot because they catered to African Americans, frankly. And um, they were so, a large they were segment of their... It. Yeah, it's a large segment of their viewership, and I it was a safe issue. I forgot how non-awful MSNBC can be, actually. When I saw them covering I was like, oh, yeah, you get, you actually aren't an awful network sometimes. <laughs> no, Chris, Chris Hayes did a fantastic job covering it, as he usually he did. does. did, yeah. Um, what was disturbing so about it, I mean, I'm Mike, I think you're right that they weren't, that, that certain, certain people with certain political views weren't able to, like, attach any kind of politics to the protesters in Ferguson, but... They attached lots of other things to them. Um, Lucy said something about, oh, well, they just mentioned the looting more, which was something yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was kind of... Yeah, that. Yeah, that was kind of like... I can't remember who was asking me about it, but I think I maybe went on... I, I went on somewhere where they were asking me about... It was probably Fox News, and I went on there, and they were asking me about the looting, and I was like, look, this is kind of blown out of proportion. There was one night of looting. Yes, there was a gas station that was burned to the ground. Another business was... Um, you know, really looted, but I mean, it was it was it was pretty much contained to one night. But then that was the 
for the for the for the naysayers, for the people who are uh, saying, oh, you know, screw these protesters, they're just like taking advantage of the situation. That was kind of like their clarion call that they used over and over again. Well, they're they're looting and they're rioting and they're causing unrest and they're causing these violent clashes with police. And that was another thing that became something that w that people were bringing up over and over again was these violent clashes with police. And I don't think that. First off, I mean, I was there every single night except for one night where there was, you know, tear gas and all that going back and forth. And it was very difficult each time to determine what exactly set it off. Like, it's not like there was one moment where a protester, like, threw a rock and then the cops are like, okay, we're going we're gonna to get you guys out of here now. It was very difficult to tell each time. It could have been the cops sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was the protesters throwing, like, bottles of water at the cops and then then what would happen every single night was the cops would say, you need to go home or face, what they would always say was face or like arrest or other consequences. And people would always be like, what are the other consequences? And they would scream this at them. And then the other consequences were clearly, we're going to fire tear gas and rubber bullets at you. So, I mean, while they didn't, weren't able to necessarily attach like, the politics to these protesters, they did have their other way, other means of, of kind of like marginalizing what their goals were and what they were calling for. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I think all everything, I agree with all of what you said, and obviously you were on the ground, so I, I defer to you on, in terms of the first-hand reporting. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the, the looting charges and the, over, uh, you know, kind of trumping up the violence was definitely a vocal strain of the right-wing reaction, but not as unanimous as it might have been if, yes. say, the protest had been organized by white hipsters and some black people joined. Yeah. Right. Just like, in in um, general, more of the right and more of the mainstream, more of the non-radical or non-right type people were more sympathetic than they have been in the past. I like mean, even, Bre even, even Breitbart people were saying, whoa, what is this uh, tank showing up? And like... You know, so it was, and 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 whereas if it was like Occupy radical anarchists or something, they would have cheered the tanks coming into town. Yeah. Also, I, want to, I also want to make the quick point that you know, um, Obama himself fostered the impression that looting was a major aspect of this because I don't know if you recall this, but his major his first statement on the subject, he he didn't denounce the police, of course, but he made a point to denounce the looters. So. Um, it wasn't I mean, just the right wing you, media doing this. Do you expect? I mean, do you expect him to denounce the police? No, I'm saying I, I, I would expect him to not trump up bogus looting allegations. Would you? Like, I don't know that I would. <laughs> no, I mean, I wouldn't expect it. I would hope he would do it, especially his most reliable constituency is black voters. And he basically abused them all the way through and went flew to Martha's Vineyard and played golf while the National Guard, under whose command. Uh, which he commands, were in the city helping police curtail civil liberties. That sounds about right. Um, yeah, it was uh, bizarre to me, and it was also something that, like, from the very first day there, was a point of uh, kind of soreness for the people there. For the people there, there, and and they were like, you know, like every time I would ask a question about that, where I was just trying to like cover both sides of it and say like. You know, what do you think about this? I mean, people get really upset because their thing, their whole thing, the entire time is like, who cares about the looting? Who cares? Who cares about the clashes with police? We're here because we feel that Mike Brown was killed unjustly by the cops. So none of this other stuff should matter. And any media or government officials or police officials who are coming in here and bringing up this other stuff, they're diluting the message that we're trying to send out. So that was something that was like super frustrating for them. I mean, the thing with the looting is that I don't know why it's so hard, especially for, you know, maybe the more right constitutionalist -y type people to say, yeah, because a couple of people have been violent or a couple of people have burned some poor bastard's uh, store down or gas station, like, is that supposed to violate this, the, the right to assembly for every single person in an entire area? I mean, or that's is that not supposed to. Is that is that in somehow a justification for not caring about the death of Mike Brown or the the very I think in some cases reasonable questions that these people were asking? I think is a larger mm -hmm. point. And why is anyone further surprised that young men, some of whom had drunk alcohol, according to some of the tweets that I remember seeing? Um, and who, who were really angry 
and to, and and joining up with one another. Rego any men, rego young men, who, like between uh, you know sixteen and twenty three, gathering at night and upset and like firing each other up are probably going to cause some problems, uh, regardless of race. So why is that treated as this like shocking development? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, now there's a pause, of course. We've got Ed, Ed back. Ed, Ed and his endless technical difficulties. Um, he can now see us, but can't hear us. All right, well, um, let's, just, let's just press on at this point. <laughs> I think that's the thing to do. Um, oh, I, I had a bunch of comments I was going to make in response to... Um, well, the, 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 the Occupy thing. I, I, I guess, since I'm the host here, I can try to speak to the things that I, I saw myself. Um... I mean, it started long before Occupy, though, Tracy. I, mean, I know. That's the, why I said the putting, not setting Ar Occupy as an arbitrary starting point. But, no, I, I realize that, but you're still referring back to it in a way. Um, so <laughs> I, can, can, can you let me get to a point that I'm Sorry, trying to stick towards? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Random, hostile person. Um, <laughs> I guess, um, I mean, uh, uh, Occupy was... I, I think it's. Uh, I don't want to put down Occupy in mass. I think that there's. It was an interesting thing. I think that they got a lot of, 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 of shit from the right wingers and a lot of exaggerations. They're all raping everyone, and that's. I mean, it was, it was terrible. But I, I think. I mean, it bodes well that in mostly you know a black community, uh, people outraged about the death of a young black man. That that is the more sympath. That's the sympathetic thing. I mean, that bodes really well. It, it, that it's not. That 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 gained enough ground in even like national review type uh, or as you say Breitbart I I missed that um, I mean because there is this element of like but there was still though I mean there was still this element that and we don't know we by still way, don't know what happened by the way did, did you realize that a Breitbart reporter was arrested Kerry Pickett this was v barely reported but uh, that's but, right like, the I night saw that, that on Twitter the yeah. night that I think. I think it was the night before uh, Ryan Devereaux got arrested, um, or maybe it was that same night. I can't recall ex precisely, but a Breitbart news reporter, Carrie Pickett, and a she's a woman, um, got arrested unjustly. And I remember asking like this guy from Red State, Ben Howe, Howe like, do you guys care that the a reporter from your flagship website got arrested? That's right. Like, I remember. Yeah. Well, well, no, I mean. We don't make a big deal about it, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay. I mean, there wasn't even, <laughs> there was no mention of that arrest on Breitbart anywhere. Was he, was he arrested and detained or arrested and re immediately released? Because there were quite a few reporters and photographers who were, um, you know, arrested technically but not taken into jail um, and, and were basically released after they showed their media credentials and, and then the cops were like, okay, we'll go ahead and let you go now. That happened to, that happened to several people that I had heard when I was there. I I think she probably was not taken to jail. I'm not 100% sure. I know she was placed under arrest and was in police custody for a couple hours. Well, and here's the thing, like, that, should, that, that doesn't really surprise me considering the methods that police were using to kind of... And, and here's the thing. They, they did a really poor job from the beginning of controlling the message. So what that then turned into was controlling the media, which is where they were um, preventing media from going into certain areas of the protest zone. Even the first night that I was there, I tried to go down to the memorial where Mike Brown was shot and killed, and it was like after midnight, and I was just point blank told by the cops, you can't go down there. So this is a public street uh, you know, it, it's a public place, and they were just like, nope, you can't go there. And then, you know, as, as it went on, and maybe about a week after that, uh, the cops had established, you know, th this protest zone was had been established, and then they had said to the media, okay, here's where you're allowed to be, and they were telling them, you know, if you go outside of this area after, you know, there was one night where they had instituted a curfew, if you go outside of it after the curfew, then you're going to be subject to arrest or other action, or removal or other action, which basically meant arrest. So they were controlling where the media were allowed to be. I was there. I tried to go down to the memorial. Control where, um, like, what they were able to report. Oh, guys, I'm getting some crazy audio thing right now. I can't go down there. So, so, um, 
the public. I cannot hear Justin at this time. Can you hear me? I, I, okay, it's I good totally now. just turned off Ed because his audio there phone. There was some like. It all went to hell. That was fantastic. Yeah, you have to get rid of Ed at this point. You have to just get rid of Ed at this point. Yeah. Anyway, so they, I mean, it, what, what was happening was that there was two groups of reporters. There were the ones who were like, okay, we're going to stay in the media area where you're saying we're allowed to be. And then there was the other group who were like, no, because that's not where anything is happening. We're not able to report on anything unless we're where we're technically not allowed to be. So that was just another situation that was bizarre to witness is cops saying, like, you are allowed here but not here, despite the fact that, like, this isn't a state of martial law. I mean, this is still just an American suburb at this point, but they were controlling it like it was basically a war zone. Yeah, that's how Ryan Devereaux from The Intercept got arrested, and, you know, he's a, he's a personal friend of mine. I reported with him extensively on Occupy in New York, and one reason why he's such a good journalist is because he doesn't listen to, like, police dictates and actually goes to where the news is, and, of course, they didn't... that They found that bothersome. Right, and, and that, uh, that, that, him up. that's another... Um, I felt like, you know, some of the people from National Review, for example, who were a little more um, sensible... There was like this initial sympathy, and then when things got too complicated, they kind of walked it back, which I've seen before. Um, you know, sure, you can you can criticize the police and all that, but then you have these you know these reporters who don't listen to police orders. You have uh, crowds of people, you know, a, a handful of whom are throwing bottles, and they they also didn't obey orders. There's this. There's this fear that when it gets complicated, when you have a large group of people and you have a lot of people who are upset about something, and they can't, you know, they can't quite be as sympathetic as they were in theory. That yes, the yeah. police are um, are out of line sometimes. Yeah, like it's, AJ Delgado, for example, who wrote that <laughs> amazing yeah. uh, National Review piece that blew my mind when I read it. Basically, <laughs> ripping police to shreds. Even she, like when the retention's picking up. Um, and it was like very, very volatile. She would kind of just instinctively side with police and like bl basically it's blame inst them. It's instinctual. It really is. There's yeah. this. I, th I think that's exactly and, like, the word for like, it. Oh, and why didn't you guys just get out of the McDonald's when you were ordered to do so for no reason? Like, right. A report sitting in a McDonald's in a bit, during business hours working, and they're supposed to just you know uh, um, meekly submit to the officer's demands. Uh, or else they're like a bad citizen. Well, I think that the instinctual not questioning of police is something that I've noticed just in my time in reporting on crime and police matters. I remember after reporting on that, that standoff that I was discussing with you guys earlier up in northern Minnesota that there was quite a few people who were upset with me for releasing the officer's name. And that wasn't even something that I pushed. That was released by the authorities and they said, this is the guy, he's been put on paid administrative leave, and then there was all of this blowback and this like huge community discussion that took place afterwards, and I remember this one woman writing in and saying, you know, it used to be that, uh, pe that police officers and law enforcement agencies, they were questioned as members of the status quo, and she was obviously referring back to the 60s, and where now it seems like, especially after 9-11, I think, mm -hmm. that that law enforcement, members of law enforcement agencies are kind of given this automatic uh, go-ahead where if, if they say something needed to happen or they're kind of just automatically assumed as being in the right for whatever it is that they do. And I think that like has been going that way since the 60s kind of faded and then like after 9-11 it really ramped up. We're to the point now where like you hear this all the time like every, every cop ever is just like automatically a hero in a lot of people's minds for whatever, you know, just for being a cop. And, well, and you know, that's something that is bothersome to me. That is bothersome. And um, I wrote my senior thesis on, uh, like, the, uh, communications. <laughs> Good choice, me. Um, it was mostly about Waco and some other kind of issues <laughs> like that. Yeah, I know. Shut up, Tracy. But it was about the the, me the way the media covered it, and it was totally fascinating to look back on it. Um, and Ruby Ridge was the same way. No, yeah, I, I was, agree. I was diving in the, uh, the, the right-wing seas. But the way that the media, to a large extent, covered this kind of event, particularly Waco, was very disturbing because they treated you know, the, the, the federal authorities, the FBI and such, as if 
as if they were this sort of like, you know, the expert on this issue you call on the phone and they have no stake in the matter. In Waco, it, you had two parties in a standoff. And you had one party barring access, you know, barring media access to the other party. Right. And so, you, but then, then you had a media who literally couldn't get to the story. They were kept miles away. And instead of, you know, constantly writing, we, we have no idea what's happening because we're two miles away. You know, FBI people say X, but we don't know. They would write, FBI people say X. Therefore, X is true. Right. There and is that's this what, idea that they're a neutral source, which is incredibly dangerous. That's what was in danger of happening in Ferguson. A lot of the times where, like, just like, like physical on the ground reporting, not necessarily even talking to protesters, because that was clearly allowed to happen. You could go down there during the day when the shit wasn't hitting the fan, but at night, when it was, like, if you weren't in the area where stuff was going down, then you weren't able to report on it. And Luckily, like, look, I'm going to go down there and do that. But it kind of brings me to another thing that is that is that happened in Ferguson and has been happening elsewhere with um, with you know all of these police involved fatalities. So, like in Ferguson, you have the official source, right? And most re most police reporting is based on primary sources, which are always going to be the authorities, right? Police say, you know, this guy tried to rob a gas station at this time and he was taken into custody and charged with whatever. So, like, that's the main mode of reporting. But then in Ferguson and a lot of other places, what you have is, like, here's what the police say, and then here's what the citizens and the witnesses say. And a lot of times, more traditional, like, legacy media outlets are going to go with the police source, and then they're not going to go and do the additional reporting of, like, here's what people on the ground said. So, obviously, you have Mike Brown and Ferguson... You have um, Azel Ford, is his last name Ford? I can't remember. In L.A., the guy who was killed by the cops there in L.A. So. And then just uh, on August 24th, you had two young kids in Chicago, Rashad McIntosh and Deshaun Pittman, who were both shot and killed by the cops. And so the cops have their side of the story, and then the witnesses have their side of the story. But a lot of times, and this is partly due to just like, staffing cuts and like a lack of time for reporters, legacy media outlets are only going to report what police said and not necessarily what the community is saying. And what the community is saying is oftentimes opposite, which then is like, well, who's really lo looking into these police-involved deaths? In Chicago, you've had 176 police-involved shootings since 2007. The Independent Police Review Authority, which is like investigates these, they've found wrongdoing in three. So I mean, yeah, I mean, I just want to. I think it's important to point out that you know the default position of reverence for police is not the default position among black people. I mean, right? It's the default position like among suburban New Jersey white idiots that I I I know. Sean but, Hannity has never been harassed by police when he's been pulled. <laughs> Well, you well, know, I bet, I, Sean Hattie, I bet Sean Hattie yeah. has been pulled over, but he accepted he accepts it as you know, um, legitimate wielding of state power. Um, and you know, the, sure uh, he does. Uh, one reason that I um, another reason I, I brought up the Occupy parallel is because so like when when they would make a, a arrests at Occupy, they would cite stuff like um, impeding pedestrian traffic, failure uh, to disperse. Uh, obstruction of government governmental action, like failure to disperse, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was that was ubiquitous in New York, anyway. And that's sort of like the same stuff that was cited as justification for arrests of both journalists and protesters in Ferguson, though uh, obviously uh, under the guidelines of whatever the Missouri statute is or whatever the local ordinance is there. So like, uh, and then of course. So, so the NYPD does that, knowing that they're not going to get any convictions on those charges, because I think like 99% of the Occupy arrests were tossed out by the judge by judges, which is actually remarkable and an undercovered aspect of that. Um, mm -hmm. that's uh, and uh, so, like th th that, they're able to conduct policing with impunity in that manner, knowing that they're just just a nonsense arrest, but doing it anyway because they know they're never going to be held accountable. I think that kind of mindset maybe I don't know transposes onto onto Missouri. Um, and I also want to add that, you know, the reverence for police thing is also a living issue when it comes to the arrest itself, which is taken as like a mark of shame 
in a lot of cases, even if you did nothing wrong and the police wrongfully arrested you. So like, um, uh, so like, uh, you know, that's why I made sure to like express quote unquote solidarity with the journalists that were arrested because even if it was thrown out, they're going to be sort of sullied by it among people who are going to like view them with suspicion now that they they are the type of person who got arrested, right? Right. Well, I think. Okay, so you're talking about these these arrests, these failure to disperse arrests that never result in any charges. Honestly, I think that a lot of times the agencies in, that are responsible for charging people and indicting people with crimes ha are probably working hand-in-hand -hand with law enforcement, and they're saying, look, we're not going to charge this, but it doesn't matter because they probably see it as a necessarily, necessary evil to clear the streets, which is the mm -hmm. argument that cops always use and used in Ferguson to say, look, we need to you guys are blocking the street, you're causing, you know, a danger to the public. But there was one night, the, the first night that Ron Johnson and Missouri State Highway Patrol took over, where he was just like, we're going to let them do what they want. And it was, it was like a party in the streets for like seven, eight hours, like people riding around on the tops of cars and like everybody going crazy. And it was like this moment of like just straight jubilation where the protesters like had this sense of like, they won. They took the street. There was no cops to be seen at all. Like, I mean, it, it could have gone crazy. You know, if somebody would have gotten hurt or if somebody popped off with a gun, it could have gone really bad. But it didn't happen all night. So I think that, like, argument of a necessarily, necessary evil is flawed a little bit because we did have that night of, like, complete peace where the cops didn't have to clear the streets. But... I don't know. Well, that's. I mean, human beings can can amass in a group without you know chaos and um and, and horrible things going on. It's it's an you know that's that's what the the police want you you to believe that they're necessary um, in all circumstances to to keep the peace. And um you know I I, I beg to differ. I I always oh, used uh, to uh, contrast. Sorry. The the difference between. <laughs> Um, the difference between you know I got I got to throw my own firsthand stuff in here. The difference between what the cops did in Oakland, Pennsylvania, which is uh, um, a little when the night Obama was elected, compared to what they did to most of the Pitt students uh, during the G20 summit. When Obama was elected, you had a lot of really obnoxious, naive college students, like a couple hundred of them, in the middle of the street, screaming. Obama, Obama, running around, and I saw five cops standing, you know, standing ready for anything that may happen. They ran around. They 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 ran, they sat all over the um lawn of the Cathedral of Learning, which is a pit <clears throat> landmark thing. Contrasted that with G20, when out of the the, the whole um you know the two day summit thing, you had a couple of um, bad incidents. You had sort of the rowdy black bloc anarchists trying to trying to make trouble, and there weren't even that many arrests when that occurred. The most G20 arrests was the, were the happened on the day after the summit when all of the political leaders were gone, and about twenty people were protesting the cops, and about you know like a couple hundred people were milling around wondering why there were nine hundred riots hanging out. And 150 people got arrested for being on their own campus in their own neighborhood. And, you know, the streets were not nearly as blocked as they had been the night Obama was elected. And, I mean, come on, you, you, you had that police reaction to people being mad what authority figures were doing. And when then they were celebrating a brand new authority figure, they, there were five cops sitting on the sidelines letting them block the streets. Because they okay, had intelligence. I, I, feel like I, need to, I feel like I need to say that I ran around screaming Obama that night too because it was awesome that a, black, <laughs> that, a, that a black guy named Barack Hussein Obama was elected in yeah, a I've heard the Patton Oswald over John skin, McCain. That was an awesome night and I don't make any excuses um, for running around screaming Obama that night. I don't make any now, excuses for you either. Okay. <laughs> or I, don't, I don't try to walk that back at all is what I'm saying. So, well, you um, should. You're yeah. kicked out of radicalism. Get out. I never, uh, I never assumed that label. So I, I want to point. You, know, so you don't just, have any labels. Hold there on no a second. So ju may, may I speak? Uh, yes, you may speak. Please go ahead. So, so Justin mentioned a few times that the cops kind of portrayed it as a necessary evil to conduct the nonsense arrests. I think that might be actually a uh, inapt descriptor 
So I don't think they view it as an evil, quote unquote. I think they view it as a justified exertion of their duly um, uh, duly afforded powers. Right. So I remember I remember thinking um, during Occupy New York how ridiculous it seemed that the number one law enforcement priority apparently was to allow for the flow of vehicular traffic in Lower Manhattan. And if you have been to Lower Manhattan, you know that vehicular <laughs> traffic is like one percent of all. Um, transport uh, in, in that area. So the idea that like um, everybody's rights need to be infringed and there needs to be this like um, massive police effort to make sure the roads are free for vehicles was just ridiculous. I mean most people in New York City hate cars um, whether conservative or liberal because they clog the place up they cause no, uh, you know, noise pollution etc. And yeah I remember Bloomberg was saying you know we have to make sure that cars can um, like uh, go down Broadway in Lower Manhattan. Nobody even drives in Lower Manhattan. I that's do just, sometimes because I'm nuts. But that's most exactly what they did in Ferguson. They did the same thing in Ferguson. They said we need to keep the street clear on West Florissant Avenue, which was like the main boulevard where all these protests were happening. So like towards the end of it, they were even like, you can protest, but you here's what they did. This was great. So they were like, you have to keep you have to be off the street, right? Because we need to keep it open for traffic. So you can be on the sidewalks on either side of Florissant protesting, but you can't stand still. Because that wasn't allowed. Right. <laughs> so you have no, it's the same in New York. It was the same in New York. Right. They were walking in like a mile long oval that they had to keep moving in to keep to continue their protests, and they did that like all night. So it was like one thing, and then the other, and then the other. It was like you can't do this. Then they would find another way to do it, and then the cops would find another way to try to prevent them to do it. It was really strange and bizarre to watch. Yeah, I, I, I that's the old like, school picket line, right? I never realized that. You always see sort of either you know a real footage or a portrayal of people, people protesting walking. in an urban. They're just going a little circle, and I, it yes. had never occurred to me until I watched that night in Ferguson. And I was like, oh yeah, that's why they're always going in their little circle with their signs. Right. Yeah, I mean, I remember, I remember just seeing the most ridiculous arrests on a constant basis, like, <clears throat> and it was always so incredibly arbitrary. It was just whoever the cops seemed annoyed by or, like, didn't like the look of, he grabbed out and arrested. I mean, there would be, and they would invent new ordinances, like people uh, sidewalk chalking, which is perfect, was per perfectly legal, as I recall. Um, people like, you know, yeah, right, standing still for too long. Um, and it was just... You know, so the, the policy was not that you're gonna you get arrested if you obstruct pedestrian traffic. The policy, in effect, was you get arrested if the cop thinks you should be arrested because he doesn't like. I mean, contempt of cop. Everybody knows that charge, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I, I have like a transition that I kind of kind of want to make to put this in a broader context. I don't know if I, if you will allow me to do that. Go for it. Possibly. Okay. So, like, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned early on that, like, so the tra the focus now moved from Ferguson to the Middle East turmoil, right? Why are you sighing, uh, sighing, and, roll your, why are you sighing and rolling your eyes? Because you you asked for permission and then j the other guest allowed you to do so. <laughs> okay. So, I'm not a left libertarian. I'm into the hierarchy of me being the host and you people being the guests at my whims. Go on, Tracy. Okay. Share with the class. So you, you, you noted early on in this, what pod, I guess you call it a podcast, that um, the, the, folk, the main focus in the news cycle transitioned from Ferguson to Middle East, right? Right. So... You know, I, I, a thought came to mind earlier today when I saw a piece on Reason uh, by Lenore Skenazi, I, th I think that's how you pronounce her name, the a woman who writes about free-range children, kids. how, yeah. like, there's, you know, parents are being criminalized for letting their kids play outside. Mm -hmm. So there was a case, she wrote about this case um, in Texas, I think, where uh, a woman let, allowed her 8-year-old daughter and her 6-year-old son to go for a short walk with an eyesight of their home to a bench. And then the, yeah. the girl walked home, and the little boy decided to play, stay and play for a while. So, of course, a busybody neighbor picked them up and brought them home, which led to a police visit, child protective services, and so, on, so forth. It's just like a, it's like a terror if you read this piece. It's just, it, it seems like, it's like a satire. I read it. Um, it does, and, yeah. And I feel like that needs to, like that stuff, along with Ferguson stuff, along with Occupy stuff, needs to be contextualized in the uh, in, with U.S. foreign policy and militarism. Because when you when you have this idea that the entire nation is in this collective struggle against 
Islamic terror or the caliphate or ISIS, Al-Qaeda, communism, Stalin, whatever it is mm -hmm. nowadays, right? It, it, it breeds this um, deference to authority such that it's, it becomes a collective delusion. And so, like, uh, so I feel like, you know, this, it, it's all inextricably linked. You can't separate this stuff because now we're being told that we need to be very fearful of ISIS. Chris Christie and Andrew Cuomo just had a joint press conference. By the way, I think Andrew, this is a total tangent, but I'm almost positive that Andrew Cuomo has smoking gun evidence on Christie for Bridgegate and is, like, strategically dangling it over him. <laughs> um, and they're, they're probably both going to get indicted at some point, but Cuomo so. could, like, sink Christie if he really wanted to. <laughs> but anyway, so they had, those two idiots had a press co joint press conference yesterday where they basically said that, Christie said New Jersey needs to, he didn't say this in these words, but he said, New Jersey needs to be prepared for ISIS. Okay, so my grandparents' shore house in Long Beach Island needs to be prepared for ISIS? Are you fucked Damn up? Damn right it does. So, <laughs> but, like, that kind of stuff transmutes into the populace and, and fosters this reverence for police. Because now police are the ones who are getting MRATs and um, tanks and all this crazy military equipment that everybody knows because we read Riley Balco. But, yes, uh, you know, but people don't really think of it in that context, so that's why I think it's important, since we're on the, since we're apparently, like, in the midst of a war right now, I feel like that's important to mention. I think that there might be something to that, though, as opposed to be contrary. I might argue that a lot of our wars in the past um, 10, 15 years have been, they haven't, they haven't been the grand struggle that, I mean, there's no draft, and there's not the, the gr in theory, there's the grand struggle, you know, fundamentalist Islam, like, we're, we're against it, they declared war on us, so we're fighting back, but because our military is so small, and because mostly our wars are pretty ignorable, that's one reason why America tends to so tolerate, tolerate them. Well... A small portion of the population has to right. actually engage. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Thank it's you. It's not a small military, though. No, no, I, I, I realize this. Um, but like, the conflicts compared to World War II or Vietnam or something are not as grand, and they're easier to ignore. And most people are not as affected by these wars. So, yes. so people in some ways, that's what allows them to keep on going. Right. So people and don't. We have. We have a fresh new, well, sort of new threat in ISIS that we're all going to be terrified about. But if it keeps going, you know, and how long before we get, like, you know, people yawn and foreign policy isn't even on the news anymore. And then it goes back to the most inane of stories. And meanwhile, the fighting will continue because it's, there, there's an attention span problem as well. It's not, it's not the grand struggle, I don't think, as much as um, terrifying people like David Brooks, you know, tend to wish it was. I think you're onto something with most people aren't affected by, um, are directly affected by military operations overseas in the same way that most people aren't affected. The majority of Americans aren't affected by the situation in Ferguson and exactly in black communities across the country and and, and poor and minority communities across mm -hmm. the country. People don't care about crime until it comes to their neighborhood, and as long as they're consistently able to keep it out of their neighborhood and to not have to deal with it, then they're never going to have really any reason to care about what's going on in someone else's neighborhood until it until something like Ferguson happens, where all of a sudden they're seeing these images that just don't make sense to their mind. You know, like when I said it was surreal to be there and witnessing, like, kids in swim goggles and bandanas throwing rocks at cops like it was Gaza or something... Yeah. I mean, most people. That's that. Those were the images that hit the average American, and was like, "Oh, well, now I should. Now I care about what's happening in a neighborhood that's not my own. Not because of the death of Mike Brown. Not because of, uh, you know, the systemic problems that the people in Ferguson face. As far as Radley Balco had like that huge piece about like all of the municipalities and way and the way that the judicial system keeps poor people down." They didn't care about it because of that. It was it was these haunting images. So I mean, it's most people don't care about wars overseas because most people don't fight in them, and most people don't care about crime in inner city and poor communities because most people don't live in them. So yeah. I guess that's maybe a, a bigger thing to take away from this. Yeah, I'm glad you I mean, mentioned Gaza, even if it was only kind of um, parenthetically, because that's a that was a facet of this as well. I mean, that was going on 
during Ferguson. So at the same time that the federal government was sending tr uh, uh, military armaments to Ferguson, uh, you know, broadly in the form of stuff they've sent through the Homeland Security Department for years, but also literally in terms of the National Guard troops, they were also sending Iron Dome money to Israel so they could continue bombing Gaza. And frankly, I'm an, I was really annoyed with libertarians, including you, Lucy, no offense, during Gaza for not speaking up forcefully about it, with some admirable exceptions, including Jesse Walker. Because, you know, uh, because they, they, there's this weird tension where there are, there are a lot of Christian libertarians who think that they need to support Israel. 500 children were killed in that thing. I mean, give me a break. Um, the, they, the Congress sent over Iron Dome money almost unanimously, except for eight congressmen who voted against it, including Justin Amash, who I, I laud constantly. But, you know, it was shameful the way that the conservatives and many libertarians treated that issue. Um, Are you making uh, a comparison between the plight of the people in Ferguson and the plight of people in Gaza? Because as someone who also made that comparison, prepare yourself for some pretty... Heavy commentary on that. Oh, I'm I'm ready for it. I've been troll. I got. I've been dealing with NFL trolls for the past couple <laughs> days. Oh, you you are. Well, oh, I also know. You know that that makes me think. The same people who generally supported the Gaza assault slash slaughter slash whatever you want to call it generally were the ones least has least likely to support the Ferguson people and likely to make excuses for Mike Brown's death are also uh, almost universally really hardcore football fans. So extrapolate from that what you will. At this point, this is just a podcast to provoke as many angry reactions as possible, isn't it? I mean, that's that's what we're going for, some sort of trifecta. Um, I'm just saying. So much... Uh, okay, the God, I don't want to spend this podcast defending my... Um, I, uh, I haven't written about that enough because I don't think I know enough about it. I stress that you don't get to kill people indiscriminately because a few of them are firing crappy rockets in your general direction. Uh, many people did disagree with me on that, including libertarians, and it was extremely disappointing. People think you get to... I mean, if we want comparisons to Ferguson, obviously it's more, it's more life and death for more people in somewhere like Gaza. But if you have a crowd of people... Um, you know, who are angry at Mike Brown's death, and you know, there's uh, 200 of them, 200 of them, and 10 of them are throwing rocks. Um, do you get to violate the right to protest 90 people? Um, I mean, and, and in Gaza, if you have a couple of people firing uh, rockets, do you get to violate the right to be alive of uh, a couple thousand people in Gaza in response to that? I would argue no, you do not. But People disagree because they don't care about people's rights or lives nearly as much as I like they would. I would, would like them to. Would the cops in Ferguson, though, have even responded that way if they didn't have access to those to that type of like weapon? Maybe not weaponry, but that type of equipment. I mean, wh where I guess that's maybe something that is a larger question that people should be asking is like if Ferguson happened 15 years ago before there was this federal program that was dumping all of this military style equipment on cops would anything like that have even happened? I, I think you have to say no because I don't think they would even have access to that type of stuff. I mean I, there was some rough crowd control stuff again since the 60s as people have pointed out has has been bad. I mean but obviously in the 60s sometimes they had live ammo and the National Guard and Four dead in Ohio and that sort yeah, and, of thing. And yeah, um, like the the 1999 Seattle um, anti globalization protest is a lot of is is, is thought of as the precursor to this because yeah, as, yeah. as as the libertarian press frequently reports, um, uh, the uh, police chief Norm Stamper has become you know said that was the greatest regret of his career to basically attack nonviolent protesters and cause a riot. Um, yep. So that was pre that pre that predated 9/11. I think you know the 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 better starting point if you're going to select one is probably the 94 crime bill, which the Democrats supported and which Joe Biden said did not go far enough. Um, yeah. You know, I also kind of you know, before I forget, I want to note something. So I'm I, I I'm an, I often uh, in New Jersey, and there's you know I grew up in this you know suburban uh, northern New Jersey town. And I was walking uh, down the street, you know, last week I think, and um, I just noted that, noticed that there were just cop cars coming every minute down the street. It was like 11 a.m. on a weekday. I'm like, what is going on here? 
there were, uh, this is a, a town of like, I don't know, 12,000 or something, uh, and it just, it seemed like the place was just swarming with cops. It was a beautiful day, so I guess they all wanted to be out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're just blanketing this town for no reason other, I guess, other than to write tickets. But it was just unbelievable. I was, it was getting to the point that I was getting literally angry and was like, had to like calm myself down and I was going to yell at a cop or something. Because... <laughs> I, there were there were like the municipal cops, so like the, the local police department regular cops. I saw cops from a neighboring town, which I don't see re often driving, and I saw New Jersey State Police like zooming past. And it was like every couple steps, I had no idea what was going on. So like that's a form of so like Ferguson was the most egregious, uh, like an extreme manifestation of this, obviously. But I feel like the mindset is seeping out such that we now accept uh, on a sunny, you know. Um, or, uh, late uh, summer day in, you know, in a northern New Jersey suburb, there needs to just be this major police presence for no reason. Yeah. Accepting their presence so that they don't become, I mean, they become invisible because they're And by there the way, the these time. guys make, like, on average, I think, 130000 a year. <laughs> the police chief, listen to this, the police chief of Carlsdatt, New Jersey, which, and Carlsdatt is in, uh, um, Hudson County, Bergen or Bergen County, Bergen County. I think it's like in the Meadowlands area where the Giants Stadium is and where um, like the football, the Super Bowl was held. Carl's that New Jersey, the police chief. If you, he has been on the job since 1978, so of course he accrues like a raise every year. The guy makes more money, literally per year, than John Boehner. Well, I don't know who deserves it less. Well, I mean, the Speaker of the House of Representatives makes less money than the police chief of this podunk, stupid little town in New Jersey that no one cares about. That's not the case, though, for, um, you know, for, like, larger municipalities. I don't, I don't know what the, the only thing that I have to go off of, I wrote about a cop in Chicago that's been the subject of several lawsuits, and he's, like, a high-level commander within the administration. He's been a cop for 28 years in the Chicago Police Department, and he makes like $124,000 a year, and he's pretty high up there. So that would tell me that the entry-level, you know, beat-walking cop is probably not pushing much more than $50,000 a year, and obviously Chicago's a pretty rough place. Oh, no, no, that's absolutely true. And the irony in this situation, at least in New Jersey, where I've investigated it pretty extensively, is that in the places where cops are like theoretically most needed, like Newark and Camden... Camden being the most beleaguered city in the country, mm -hmm. those cops make the least. Whereas the police in like up, uh, upper middle class to to upper class suburbs who sit around writing tickets all day and maybe responding to a, a, a high school drinking party make upwards of literally two hundred thousand. The the, the well, police chief in Carlsbad made two hundred thirty thousand a year. Just like teachers. Well, this this comes back to the whole, I mean, we could all radically yell, abolish all the cops, but they exist, so ideally we want them to say, respond if someone is about to be, you know, raped or, or murdered or there's some, you know, kidnapping. The, vi the violent crimes and the, the things where people are, are in direct danger, you want a cop to respond and... I mean, I, I'm sure you, you guys know that you, you can't sue the cops for not responding. Courts have ruled that they don't have, unless they have made a deal with you if you're an informant or something like that, they don't have an obligation to protect individuals. They have an obligation to protect society at large. So if you call them six times, you know, because your house got broken into and then you get kidnapped and raped and murdered, there's nothing, there's nothing for your family to do about that. There's this, and that concerns me because there is this, this, this element of, you know, if, if, if there is this situation where you want somebody with a gun, um, somebody you can dial the number of to come and do something when it really maybe does matter and it maybe, it, you know, it's okay, you're not going to radical hell if you call the cops, they're not necessarily going to come. Um, you know, when you had the Rodney King riots, which were very, you know, scary and lots of bad things that were not okay happened to innocent people, but... You know, you, you, you had people taking over the sections of Los Angeles, and the cops were too scared to go in there because the, the situation was too hot. I mean, it sort of seems like when the chips are down and when you might need a cop, per, per se, that, that they don't necessarily show up because they're busy 
you know, writing those tickets so that they can make their quotas and they're, they're, they're kicking in the, the weed dealer's door and that sort of thing. Well, it seems in, case, in certain cases it's arbitrary. And again, going back to Ferguson, there was, there was nights where they were like, oh, we need to clear the street, we're going to do whatever we can, need to do to do that. There was nights where they let the protesters have the street, and then there was one night where they literally just left and left the, left the, the convenience store that Mike Brown was supposedly uh, to have stolen these like, boxes of cigars from. Like I sat there and watched the cops drive away and leave it open to looters. So it seems really kind of arbitrary mm -hmm. like when and where they decide that they need to protect and serve and there doesn't there's like not really any oversight that like calls them out on that other than maybe some media coverage. Yeah, but right. can I do a, a lack of logic it seems like in a lot of their decisions. Um I I I mean Wait, can I can I just I, before I, I want to do a quick shout out to the Alex Jones Infowars crew for their coverage from Ferguson which was actually stellar. I know, I watched that. It was really good, you're right. It was, it was unbelievable. Bizarre. Except whenever there was um, problems with the live stream, I, I wouldn't put it past any of them to be, like, faking it, you know? Oh, well, uh, the live stream's going out. They, they're using their super weapon to disrupt our transmission. I mean, there's still an element of, like, <laughs> I don't necessarily trust, like, what will happen to you people, but they were actually doing a really good job. Well, it's, I mean, the, 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 their, their logic doesn't make any sense because the logic at its core is just preserve this institution so that people can keep making money as police and not be subject to scrutiny. I mean, I remember during Occupy, the, the most kind of palpable symbol, symbol of the culture of impunity that kind of ran, uh, ran roughshod over everybody was that, so like one at one time I was, um, so there was a big march, I don't know if you remember this, from Lower Manhattan up to Times Square on, I remember the date, October 15th, 2011. Um, is that the bridge day? No, this, this was later. The bridge okay. day kind of like catalyzed it into like this crazy thing that no one thought it was going to become. But I think this is like mm -hmm. the next, the following week. Um, and you know, so I was, you know, I, I had been kind of like documenting people who I thought were cops but weren't identifying as such. Mm -hmm. And I had taken like at Zuccotti a, fit, a photo of this guy who I was almost certain was a cop. And um, at one point, like, he tried to, like, block his face with a newspaper. It was, like, the most comical cartoon thing. Well, either that or he thought you were a cop. I mean, sometimes it's comical. So, but, but, then, but then, so on that march, I took another photo of him, and I, I, I asked him his name. At which point, he literally, and I'm not exaggerating this at all, he took me, and this was, like, a, probably a 60-year-old, um, very rotund guy shaped like a grape, um, who... Pushed, pushed me with his stomach into a, into the wall on the, on the sidewalk, public street, and um, basically threatened me with violence. Uh, and I had two witnesses who observed it, and I immediately got them on video recounting what happened. I could show you the video. I still have it. Mm. Um, but I didn't, I didn't get the incident on video because it just came out of nowhere. Yeah. So I was wondering, like, is this guy, this guy must be police, right? Or else he would be subject to arrest for this. This is an assault. And I, I, um, I crowdsourced and I couldn't figure out who this guy was. So I crowdsourced it, and eventually I figured out that this guy was a, his name was Luke. I'll tell you his name. Lieutenant Daniel, D A N I E L J Albano, A L B A N O, of the NYPD Legal Affairs Department. This is the guy who crafts po legal policy for the NYPD. He oh works God! In like the, he works in like the, the you know um, the, the 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 top floor of the One Police Plaza. He he crafts legal arguments to justify that's, what the police can do, and he is that's the, very he, he, disturbing. He, and he assaulted me. I mean, it was I wasn't injured or anything, but he he subjected me to uh, force without consent. Well, that so, sums it up, doesn't it? Just a, just a bit. I mean, that yeah, that sums it up. All right, y'all. Um, <laughs> Um, all right. How long have we been going okay. here? If you ask that, it'll take ten more minutes off of our, our, our count. Okay, after all this, what... Two questions, I guess. Is Ferguson going to make a difference to police policy? I mean, we, we, had, we already had someone doing a hearing on militarized police. It's as if our elected officials suddenly were like, oh, my goodness, all of this... Here is being sent to police departments. Why didn't someone tell me? This is news to me, as if they couldn't have found it out themselves. 
Um, so is that, you know, will, will there be any different, difference in police? Will there be any changes, improvements, reforms? Um, is my first question. You know, let's, let's, let's stick with that. Do uh, you guys have any hopes for reform in any, in any way, thanks to Ferguson? If there's going to be changes, they're going to be in the ways in the way that um, police respond to these t situations. But again, going back to Bradley Balco's like really <laughs> super long and epic thing about the systemic problems that poor and minority communities face. I mean, that's the change that is going to be necessary to prevent these situations from occurring in the first place. Because it wasn't just the death of Mike Brown; it was all of those things that were kind of bubbling under the surface, and then that's what kicked it into high gear. So, I mean, I think they're probably you probably will see like reduced militarization and changes in response to crowd control, but we're not going to see any changes about like the root problems. Yeah, I have virtually I think, zero, yeah. I have almost no hope for any kind of reform. I mean, there yeah. are some there are some uh, welcome developments in terms of like local jurisdictions and city councils and stuff saying, "Hey, send back your weaponry. We don't want it." Mm -hmm. like, um, but like that's they're going to do that in like Santa Cruz and uh, and you know, like Vermont or something, but that's not going to be widespread. And further, you know, just broad, even despite those isolated uh, incidents of good developments, you know, if, if the country is at war with ISIS for, for like uh, three years or whatever it is now, there's not going to be appetite for removing powers from police domestically. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's not, there needs to be, this, in order for this to ha any kind of reform to happen, it would have to be during "quote unquote" peacetime, and even then, it would be difficult. But you know, while the while we're in a war fever, and while there's a beheading video coming out every two weeks, no, I don't see any chance that there's going to be any change. So the cops will save us from ISIS. We got to make sure that yeah. they're there to save us from ISIS when they come. It's true. And then also, while we're all distracted talking about this, no one's been no one. The conversation about drone technology and how law enforcement utilizes that is kind of gone away too, which is another really disturbing thing. Yeah, our drone dystopia is a common. Uh, just give it a couple more years. <laughs> Alright, well here's another, here's another question then though. Um, the thing about police, I mean, um, I, I'm usually reminded of how many years ago, whatever years ago it was when uh, Shay Calvo, the mayor of that little Maryland suburb or Virginia yeah. suburb. Um, his house. He 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 was the recipient of one of those operations oh, yeah. where somebody sends weed to an address, um, and he had no idea. But the cops intercepted that package and they raided his house and they shot his dogs. You know, he's a white middle class dude. He was a politician, and the fact that that happened to him, you know, it didn't obviously didn't save the day or solve much of anything. It just made SWAT slightly accountable for a short period of time in his particular area. But it got more attention because he's, he was a, a less ignorable type of guy. Right. You know? And when, when that's, the, that's the thing. With, with victims of police, black males, you know, there's this, there's this vague idea that, well, did he have an, a, a record or what was he wearing? I mean, if, I mean they're, they're, you know, there's, there's the subtext there. It's, Back in, in, in the 90s, um, I, I would argue that Waco and Ruby Ridge and stuff, there's another type of, of person that is, is not trustworthy. You had the crazy right-wingers who, who, who must have deserved it. There's, there's the homeless people who are crazy. Crazy people in general deserve it. There's, there are all these people that must have done something to provoke this response. And unfortunately, it, it usually comes back to, for me, and oh, even even snotty college students occupied just a bunch of jerky college students. G20, well, that was just a bunch of annoying pit students who always like ride over football, so they all deserve to be tear gassed on their own campus. People deserve it for some reason, and until you get to the type of person who who who's who's you know a, a white politician um, who couldn't possibly have done something to actually provoke this, they didn't do any drugs. Drug drug users obviously deserve it. Unless you get to those people, it won't change. It's a pretty narrow segment of the population, too. I think no. I think that's a really good point because that kind of uh, uh, feeds into a broader theme of what we're discussing here, which is that so, so 
let's say so I'm a I'm a cool libertarian who likes vinyl records, right? And I'm against um, <laughs> interventionist foreign policy, but you know I'm for it in this special case where ISIS is especially scary and they're starting a caliphate, or Hamas is especially dangerous to Israel. Therefore, I'm okay with the U.S. government transferring arms to Israel to bomb 500 children. You know, I'm mostly against um, police. Crackdowns, but you know things got a little out of control, and they had to help the business owners in Ferguson. So, I mean, this is a kind of mindset that pervades a lot of people who pose as these enlightened critics of like state power, but really are just they just recognize that like it's kind of incumbent upon them to take up that pose now, or else they look like monsters. But when in, in reality they have no theory, you know, they have no actual objection to these kind of exertions of force. They just kind of uh, pretend they do because they don't want to be. You know, perceived as uh, you know violent reactionaries when that's just the the core of what they're advocating, but they want to dress it up with like, oh, I'm cool. All right. Well, there's probably something to that, but to expand our not just criticize four unnamed people on Twitter that you're probably talking about, or a hundred of them, I don't know. Here's here, here's the new question then. If there's usually a category person that doesn't count um, in their, you know, their life or their freedom to assemble or talk or, or, or not be in jail, if that doesn't matter, how do you, I mean, we've had a very, very insular podcast because, you know, we, all of us have seen police behave poorly and all of us agree that something is horribly, horribly wrong there. How does one convince the... Um, both the unwashed masses and the, you know, the, 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 the intellectual people who keep failing, as Tracy has, has mentioned. Like, do you, I mean, is simply talking about it incessantly, writing about it incessantly, is that going to do anything? Do we just keep doing that until we die? I mean, <laughs> I don't know if there's any way to convince people who, who like you, you were saying about, well, every, every time something bad happens to someone, then... They, you have to break down what those people have done to deserve it, and apparently the people who don't deserve it are in such a narrow category that that's going to take a hell of a lot of convincing on a whole lot of different subject matter to be able to tell people, like, hey, maybe they didn't deserve it because if they have any kind of criminal record, then they deserve SWAT kicking down their door for, like, a minor, what, like, weed possession charge. Then they're also a drug user, so then they also deserve it. And then there's, you know, myriad other things. So, I mean, I don't know how you convince everyone that that's wrong other than, like I said before, people don't necessarily care about issues until they directly affect them. So maybe yeah. what we should wish for is that, like, cops just get more and more out of control and then the more wealthy white politicians that get their doors kicked in by unwarranted SWAT raids, maybe the more that happens and the more people will start paying attention to it. I yeah, fear only, that might be true. The only way to accomplish this, in my judgment, is to do the painstaking, incremental work of building a freaking rational society that's not constantly crippled by war propaganda and uh, police um, worship. I mean, uh, so that means, like, for example, boycotting the NFL. And I'm serious, because the NFL, I mean... Think of what the kind of values of that imbues in the public. It's okay to play a game where you bash each other's brains out and you cause brain, literal brain damage where the players are shooting themselves by age 50 and are vegetables. I mean, that's a big deal. I'm, I'm getting a lot of hate for this issue because, you know, it's, it's, it's real. Um, it means not, for example, demonizing tea partiers because you're culturally dissimilar from them and, and you support gay marriage. And, and calling for uh, police to crack down on them because you don't think they should assemble. It means, you know, viewing black people and black lives as legitimate lives. I mean, these black people were probably in this country before you were if you're a white person. Um, so it's just, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's thinking of people who live in Gaza as actual humans rather than terrorists who um, are implicated in the crimes of a um, a minority a minority within Hamas who, uh, who who shoot rockets into civilian areas and don't hardly ever kill anybody? Um, I mean, those are actual humans, 
even though you know they're 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 Muslims, although most of them probably aren't even devout Muslims at all. They're just like you are, meaning you were raised Catholic and you maybe went to church when you were little, but you don't believe in the transubstantiation. I mean, actual there, there has to be a, an expansion. Pointing out that people are actual humans, I believe that probably is. To me, that's the key issue: is that these people there's some there's some there's some di differences, but those people are exactly as human as you are. The Mexican immigrant shot, or the, not even the immigrant, the Mexican dude on the other side of the border fence shot by the border patrol person. It's just as much a person as you are. Um, so is the black guy in the hoodie. So is the gun-toting whomever sitting in Idaho. I mean, and, and so way, it certainly is the drug user. And and there is this there's this like atrophied empathy that people like their sense of empathy is atrophied for these people because they're they're different than I am. And yeah, and you know, it also means it also means not letting Ted Cruz get away with appearing before a concert of Chris, minority Christians uh, 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 facing genocide in the Middle East against ISIS. Which you know, as much as we want, as as it's right, I think to oppose a multi-year war effort in Iraq and Syria, we have to acknowledge that this ISIS group is absolutely vicious. Um, and uh, you know, there if there could be reasonable steps to take to mitigate the danger that they're posing to people. Because I mean, read some of the stuff of them like putting swords to old ladies' necks and, and demanding they convert from the religion that they've um, uh, held to their entire lives. I mean, this is a uh, insane stuff. Um, you know, you have to. I actually lost my train of thought there, but <laughs> I think you see where I'm going. Ted Cruz. ISIS oh, bad. Ted Cruz, right, Ted, Ted Cruz. Cruz bad. So it means, it means not letting Ted Cruz get away with, with that stunt, which he probably will and will probably win the GOP 2016 nomination, as I predicted. But um, no. uh, uh, no. you, can't let him, you can't let people who, who thrive on and, and build their political careers on cruelty and dehumanization get away with it, which is... Uh, That's I'm, literally I'm, almost everyone in politics. And I'm, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm thankful that, you know, these tradcons, as they call themselves, traditional, you know, Catholics, mostly conservatives, are going after... Tradcons? Literally never heard that in my life. I must have blocked well, like, it out. Roman Catholics who reject Vatican II... Oh, I don't uh, want to get into a whole you know discursive thing. Let's not talk about. Let's not get into Vatican II right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, but but you know, so they they've been going after Ted Cruz, but I've been I want to tell them, for example, that hey, I agree with you about this Ted Cruz stunt, and I I, I hate the genocide of, of Christians in in the Middle East. But where were you when five hundred children were killed in Gaza? I mean, why is it only your co-religionists who uh, warrant your empathy? So there has to well, be just a the acceptability general... of war casualties is, is is a whole another thing that most most people believe in the acceptability of casualties of war they do. Yeah, um, so there has to be a broadening it's... of the sphere of empathy to include people who even you might not think who or who are again culturally dissimilar to you but are still humans. That that, that I suppose we could leave it on that. That's uh that's pretty good. All right, real quick, kids, um, promote your works and where to find them and what you're working on next or recently. Briefly, Tracy, you go first. Oh, okay. Uh, I think my Twitter handle is on my little thingy on the screen, right? Yes, it is. At mtracy, Tracy with an E. Always get confused with this guy, Mark Tracy, who does not have an E in his name. Public. I am not that guy. Um... And what am I working on now? I'm writing a thing actually on Scottish independence. Vote yes if you're in Scotland. And I, I, hold on, I don't presume to lecture the Scots on how to vote. However, if I were a Scot, I would certainly be voting yes, and I would be on the streets waving placards to that effect. Because um, I think that the Scottish independence movement is a huge momentous event that's being obscured now by this Middle East stuff, ironically. But you know, I, 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 it's gonna it's gonna have an effect on Catalonia independence in Spain, on uh, Italian. Not talking about Catalonia in independence right now. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm thirty seconds more, and so and it could even it could even bleed out bleed out into um, America where you have Hawaii independence, Puerto Rico independence, Vermont independence. God willing, where I will move. Um, free Vermont, free Vermont. The yeah. Second Vermont Republic has to happen, or else we're screwed. I'm so um, ready. I'm ready. Uh, so that's what I, I'm writing on a thing having to do with that. For that wasn't even good. Pro <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Let it promote it yourself. You just said you're writing about Scotland for somewhere. What else should, what else should I say? I don't know. You write lots of things for places. <clears throat> Never mind. You're done. All right, I, Justin. I have nothing else to add. <laughs> Fine, good. Justin, uh, where can the people read your works? And uh, such? I, I write mainly for Vice and the Daily Beast. I also have a project going that uh, will address issues of child welfare on a remote North Dakota Indian reservation uh, that has been... The, there's been a lot of problems there with uh, the child welfare system, and actually last week I just learned that a, a one-year-old child died in some kind of car accident there. Um, it's, a, it's a strange and interesting situation, and uh, one that's a, apparently a pretty dangerous environment for children, so I'm trying to keep tabs on that as best I can. Okay. Speaking of people that um, got screwed like over. Project. Yeah, it does. I'm always I'm interested in that. People who get screwed over and not cared about in America can't do much better than uh, Native Americans. Yeah, no doubt. That's for sure. um, so, yeah, people should go. These, these, these gentlemen are fine writers, and you should read their works. Um, and, uh, yeah, me. You can read my stuff at Vice and Anti-War and Rare and the Stag Blog when I remember to update it. Um, I was recently complaining about the Border Patrol, so conservatives are insulting me a little bit on Twitter, and that's fun. Um, man, this went on forever. Well, thank you, future audience, and briefly current audience, but not anymore. I think they all left because we were rambling. Uh, yeah, L Lucy Staggerwald, Liberty.me, cops are bad. See you next F time. F the police! <laughs> yes, thank you, Tracy.